Welcome to Dan's On Fandoms. I'm Dan. The train keeps rolling with The Mandalorian, and man, what a great episode Chapter 11 was. Danny and I, along with a myriad of Star Wars fans, got our wish and got to see Katie Sackhoff appear in live action as Bo-Katan Kryze, which was just so awesome. There's a good amount to discuss, so let's dive into our top 7 baller moments from Chapter 11, The Heiress. Starting us off at number 7, the frog lady clutching her eggs as the Razor Crest limps toward Trask. The Razor Crest is still in bad shape after encountering those Spider's last episode, which Lucasfilm's creative art manager, Phil Zostak, has said were not Krikna's. How about that? The trio are approaching Trask, but the Crest's landing array isn't responding, so Din has to land that puppy manually, which leads to a bumpy entry into Trask's atmosphere before landing that bad boy in the sea. I enjoyed hearing Din say Dank Farrick as the Crest is rapidly descending into Trask's atmosphere, which we hear another character say later in the episode. I feared for the frog lady's eggs when she helped Din try to land the Razor Crest but thankfully the child kept those little green paws off of her eggs. An AT-AT looking machine of sort pulls the crest out of the water and they finally arrived on Trask. That then brings us to our number 6 baller moment, the frog lady and her husband reuniting. As Din and the frog lady stepped into Trask, I couldn't help but have the biggest smile across my face. Seeing all of those Quarren and Mon Calamari walking around wearing outfits akin to fishing folk just made me so damn happy. It's moments like these that have always brought me so much join Star Wars, seeing a world inhabited by aliens who are just living their lives. Gotta love the Star Wars galaxy. Anyway, the frog lady and her husband, who I'm calling Frogman, soon reunite and we get a quick glimpse of Sasha Banks' character eyeing up Din before she quickly disappears. The frogman is then able to point Din in the direction of someone that could help him find other Mandalorians. That then brings us to a seaside restaurant where the child has some chowder, and I couldn't help but chuckle when that octopus jumped on the child's face. Amon Calamari then introduced introduces Din to a Quarren, who tells Din he could take him to other Mandalorians by boat. Which then brings us to our number 5 baller moment, the sleazy Quarrens deserve to rot. As Din and the child traverse the seas of Trask with a group of Quarren, they're soon double-crossed by those slimy bastards. The group's leader tosses the child into a tank of water that's home to a gross-looking sea creature called a Mamacor, which swallows the child and its pram. Din quickly jumps into the water after the child, and the Quarren lock him in hoping to take his Beskar armor. As Din tries to to escape, we get our number 4 baller moment, Bo-Katan freaking Kreez arrives. As Din struggles to escape, help soon arrives and it's my homegirl Bo-Katan Kreez and two other Mandalorians, one of which is Sasha Banks' character, whose name is Casca Reeves. Even though she's not Sabine, I'm still holding out hope that Sabine will appear, and I think she will but more on that momentarily. Anyway, as soon as we saw the owl painted helmet, Danny and I both yelled, it's Bo-Katan. Neither of us could contain our smiles and joy. I love the shots of Bo-Katan rescuing Din from the water, which mirrors the shots from Season 1 when Death Watch rescued him as a child on Aquatina. Additionally, I'm assuming that Casca Reeves and the other Mandalorian with Bo-Katan are a part of the Night Owls, which were an elite Mandalorian unit made up of female warriors led by Bo-Katan Kryze. Obviously, we got a dude here, so things have clearly changed. The group is able to make short work of the Quarrens, and Casca Reeves rescues the child and returns him to Din. Din tells Bo-Katan and the other Mandalorians he's been quested to return the child to its kind, and then Bo-Katan and the other two Mandalorians remove their helmets to Din's bewilderment. Our man is shook by this, asking them where they've acquired their armor, since all he knows of Mandalorian culture is that a true Mandalorian does not remove their helmet. The male Mandalorian with Bo-Katan states that Din is one of them, and Koska Reeve says Dank Farrick, and I just love it. Since that's the Star Wars version of crap or damn it, Bo-Katan attempts to assuage Din's concerns by explaining that her armor has been in her family for three generations that she was born on Mandalore and fought in the Purge, and that Din is a child of the Watch, referring to Death Watch. Bo-Katan explains to Din that Death Watch is a cult of religious zealots that broke away from Mandalorian society with the goal of re-establishing the ancient warrior ways and culture of Mandalore. Din doesn't take this very well and pieces out. The shot of Bo-Katan, Koska Reeves, and the other Mandalorian flying off as the sun is setting is just so dope. I love that they also blow up the corn ship like, Peace out, turds, so long to your boat. We 
then come to our number three baller moment, Din agrees to help Bo-Katan. After Din is back on shore, a group of Quarren surround him, with one telling him he wants vengeance for the death of his brother, and he plans to kill the child. Bro should have slowed his roll because my homegirl Bo-Katan arrives, tells the Quarren it was her that killed his brother, and then she and the Night Owls judo chop them into oblivion. The quartet then have a drink together where Bo-Katan explains to Din that Trask is a black market port where weapons plundered from Mandalore are being staged. The plan, according to Bo-Katan, is to seize these weapons and use them to retake Mandalore and seat a new Mandalore on the throne. The title Mandalore was a title assumed by the sole leader of the Mandalorian people. Initially, Din has no interest in helping Bo-Katan, but after explaining to Bo-Katan and the Night Owls that he must return the child to the Jedi, Bo-Katan informs Din she can lead him to a Jedi in exchange for helping them with their mission to infiltrate a Gozanti freighter and steal the weapons aboard, to which Din agrees. Din then leaves the child with Frog Lady and Frog Man, and I chuckled at Din telling the child to mind his manners, only for the child to eye up those eggs like he hasn't eaten in weeks. And then a tadpole bursts from an egg, and Little Man is blown away. Freaking love it. We then arrive at our number two baller moment, Din and the Night Owls take down a Gozanti freighter. Once Din and the Night Owls are aboard the Gozanti, they quickly make it through the ship, kicking ass and taking names. How awesome was it when Din tossed those smoke bombs, and they used their infrared vision to murk those stormtroopers. I especially enjoyed when they took control of the cargo control area and the stormtroopers and imperial officers get sucked out of the cargo holds hatch. That prompts the commanding imperial officer to contact Moff Gideon and request backup, only for Gideon to tell the imperial officer that hope is lost and he's got to sacrifice himself and the ship without letting the armaments aboard the Gozanti fall into the hands of Bo-Katan and her night owls. Long live the empire my booty cheeks. Din, Bo-Katan, and the night owls stop him from plunging the Gozanti into the sea, however, and Bo-Katan wants to know where the Darksaber is. The imp essentially confirms that Moth Gideon has the Darksaber, but then murks himself. The Night Owls prepare to jump to hyperspace in the Gozanti, and Din declines their offer to join them, bringing us to our number one baller moment of the episode, Ahsoka Tano, here we come. After Din declines Bo-Katan's offer to join them, he asks her where he can find a Jedi, and Bo-Katan tells him to take the child to the city of Caladan on the forest planet of Corvus, where he'll be able to find Ahsoka Tano. Guys, there have been so many rumors about Ahsoka Tano appearing this season. I didn't want to 100% buy into those rumors and get my hopes up, but I'm so, so damn excited that Ahsoka Tano is set to appear this season. Rumors have it that Rosario Dawson will be playing our homegirl, so we'll have to wait and see. Praise the maker. As the episode ends, Din picks up the child from the Frog Lady and Frog Man, and the child is playing with their baby tadpole, which is adorable. The duo return to the Razor Crest, and Din discovers that the Mon Calamari mechanic basically jerry-rigged the crest back together, even though Din gave him a thousand Mon Calamari flan. Before the episode ends, we see a nasty-looking octopus creature about to attack the child, but Din grabs it and the child has himself a snack as the two set off for Corvus. Guys, I'm not sure I can perfectly articulate how much I love pretty much everything about this show. After we finish watching Chapter 11, Danny and I gushed over it, as well as discuss what an excellent job Bryce Dallas Howard did directing this episode. Aside from how awesome Season 2 has been thus far, the appearances of characters such as Boba Fett, Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, and probably Sabine, and who knows what other characters, totally opens up the possibility for Lucasfilm to develop a myriad of Star Wars shows and content. Who wouldn't want to see a spin-off series of Bo-Katan and the Night Owls fighting the Empire during the days of the Purge and after the Empire has fallen to retake Mandalore? Or even a series showcasing Boba Fett's life after he escaped the Sarlacc Pit? There's so much possibility and I'm here for it. Additionally, the series has done a great job at showcasing how the child's interactions and experiences leave an imprint upon him. Characters such as Quill, Pelly, the Frog Lady, and Frog Man have shown the child love, care, and compassion. And while Din does show love and compassion to the child, their circumstances and Din's history have shown the child a world of violence, greed, and malice as they've been forced to encounter criminals and warlords. Again, we see that dichotomy perfectly demonstrated this episode when the child was swallowed by the sea creature as those Quarrens are trying to steal Din's armor. Yet, later in the episode, the Frog Lady and Frog Man watch over the child while Din's gone and when Din returns, they're lovingly watching the tadpole swim in a bowl. The child has seen some shit in his life, to say the least. It does make me wonder how this will affect the child as he ages and grows, and I definitely think this dichotomy in his upbringing and experiences will come to a head at some point in the series down the line. Will the child hover
hover more towards the light side, the dark side, or maybe somewhere in between, it'll be interesting to see for sure. All in all, this was another stellar episode and I'm so excited to see what chapter 12 has in store for us next week. But what did you think about this episode and what are your thoughts about Bo-Katan's inclusion? Let us know down in the comments. Want more Star Wars content? Check out some of our other videos. Please like and subscribe and stay nerdy.